we have successfully come to the end of the circuit breaker period today as we gradually usher in phase one of resuming activity safely tomorrow. Listeners tuning in may be intrigued to know that during this COVID breaker period, our latest analysis show that there has been more than 430 new transactions done virtually online. It's really quite exciting to see how fast our local buyers adapt to new technology to buy properties and also embrace new ways of gaining knowledge to aid their decision-making process. RHD's consumer webinar series is one of these key new initiatives that empowers potential property buyers or sellers out there with the latest market news and trends right from the comforts of their home. Our carefully selected speakers in the series will be sharing with you key insights and latest research in the property market to help you make informed and prudent decisions for your future property plans. And it's really great to see so many listeners tuning into our webinar this afternoon. Thank you so much for taking time off to join us. I'm pleased to introduce our speaker today. Our esteemed speaker is none other than Mr. Alson Chia, Associate Executive Director at Orange D and Alson has over 20 solid years of experience in real estate with a key focus in the luxury segment. He works in close partnership with his life partner, Brenda Z, who is also one of our expert panelists today. Hi, Brenda. Alson is currently the project IC for the Corals and Novell 88, and he also has his partner, Brenda, oversee a portfolio of luxury projects, which includes Cascaden Reserve, South Beach Residences, Boulevard 88, and Swin Regis Residences. Alson also comes with valuable experience on a global scale, leading his sales team to participate in overseas property conventions held in Shanghai and in Hong Kong from 2018 to 2019. Alson was one of the key speakers tasked to promote Singapore properties to overseas buyers, and he currently sees a growing interest from foreign investors. His personal mantra is making human connections should always precede the subject matter. And overall, real estate has always been a very integral part of his life. The topic Alson will be covering today, future trends from past cycles. He will be sharing with us an in-depth analysis to identify trends and turning point in the property market. He will also share how listeners today can translate property fundamentals into actionable insights while navigating into the future. A gentle reminder for our listeners tuning in, if you have any questions pertaining to the talk or the property market in general at any point during the discussion, all you have to do is click on the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen and type in your questions. We have on standby a panel of real estate veterans and experts to answer all your burning questions. You can also address your question directly to the speaker, Alson, which he'll be taking after the presentation. I'm sure all of you are waiting eagerly for the talk to start, so without any further delays, let me invite our speaker for today, our esteemed Mr. Alson Chair. Alson, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ramesh. Appreciate the introduction. I think you have spoken also about the topic. So we are just right in. It's great to share this topic to everyone over this webinar this afternoon. Let's live track in. First, I want to start with an overview. We want to look at the context before we talk about the topics that has been pointed out. But the current climax, we all know, is unprecedented. This has been a word that has been used so frequently, and the short-term impact on the economic, business, financial front are undeniable. The office, shops, factory store, supply chain are disrupted. Consumer spending also are, are badly affected because of this lockdown, which we call it circuit breaker in our context. Fortunately, we are about less than 48 hours away, so when they leave it up, they are doing it in phases. In context, we want to highlight past crises, how respective world leaders sweep in and mitigate to restore economy. And most of the leader, if you have heard them, the approach or their stand is that they will do whatever it takes to combat any crisis. And in this current situation, COVID-19. We are covering both areas, fundamental analysis and technical analysis. In this fundamental analysis, we know there's a lot of topic that you can probably list down. You have the government policy, you have the monetary policy, you look at the, uh, what we call the economics, you look at the growth industry. There are many things that you have to consider all that. But we will touch on just basically two areas 
the growth of real estate industry and of course the government policy which play a very significant role. But what I want to do is that I want to be able to make everything to give you a simplistic approach. You may say, is it possible? Because you have all the information, but it matters how the market will unfold. It has to encompass all the fundamentals. And this include, of course, as I mentioned, the real estate potential, taking into account the population growth, the urban design planning infrastructure that our nation has in the pipeline. Now, this is an area which will be something new to you because this is not new to those who are traders in the financial instrument. Property, because the URA property price index, they kind of tabulate it on a quarterly basis. So very seldom people will talk about technical analysis, but I may want to share this to let you know that we can use the chart, which is available, where they plot all the property price index. This will give you a roadmap. All our approach is to identify indicators. But importantly, when you want to approach this, you have to approach it with an unbiased frame of mind, knowing that the market itself contains all the factors that drives it. I'd like to walk you down the memory lane and straight time index, our share market is where I will start because we find that stock market is the habit of the economy. It kind of reflects the status, the health of the economy. So we look at from the earliest 1990, where it was at this stage, there was a run up because of liberalization of CPF for housing. And it also uh, given a lot of HCB grant in 1994 and the straight time index actually raised up in a very bullish trend. In a way, before the actual crisis sets in, fortunately, I would think our government had a foresight. They literally comes in way before it in May 1996 to have what we call an anti-speculation measure. The toughest was they imposed the capital gain tax. They raised the loan to value. And subsequently, in about October 1997, this was triggered by Thai baht, where they could not have the foreign currency to support, to pack it and they let it float. So when that started, it triggered a lot of currency was being devalued. Singapore is not spare as well, but we were fortunate that our drop in the depreciation of Sing dollars was only about 18%. If you compare it to Indonesia, you're talking about almost 500%. It was 3,000 rupiah to US, and then it went all the way to 15,000 to US. Of course, Thai baht ringgit also has dropped down 50%. And following which, at about 1998, September. Back then, Dr. Mahathir imposed capital control. At that point, because a lot of uh, shares of the KL was traded in our stock exchange, they call it the clock market, central limit order book. And in September, Dr. Mahathir declared this as illegal. It's not recognized. So the bank refuses to accept this as collateral. But at the point of announcement, amazingly, the stock market picks up which means to say all the news are all there. The bad news, whatever you can see, is all there. So we go on to the second segment where market picks up in 1998, September, all the way up. And we had the, what we call dot-com bubble. And that was the fear, the concern, the internet buzz. And of course, as it come off, you have the September 11 attack. And following which it was the impending Iraq war and the SARS that comes in again at this point. But notice it was a series of four, five, four events. So when SARS hit, it's almost at the tail end. Surprisingly, of course, the government responded as well and market shot up. And this stage itself, we will cover a bit later that why it's an inviting business environment from 2003 to 2007, where it shot all the way up. And next is, comes in was the global financial crisis, the subprime crisis that from October 19, 2007, you saw the plunge again all the way down. Notice. This plunge is pretty severe. It went past the previous height of the Asian financial uh, crisis. That was the peak in 1996. Then at this point, 2009, again, a lot of government measure comes in. We'll elaborate a little bit more. Then market shot up again. And this point where it went up, it was excessive liquidity because of the low interest. There was this quantitative easing. There are three rounds of QE and a lot of cash is flooding the system. Literally, they issued the local currency bond and from the proceeds they bank into the system. So the market went all the way up and this period was 2009 to 2013. That's the QE period. So let's go to the last segment which we are currently in before the COVID which was just about in uh, the first case was in January. But let's look at the previous other two crises. It's there but it's not so severe. There was this grass seed, there was this default on the IMF loan 
and after which it was the US and China trade war. So all in all, this is what exactly happened. You see four crises over there. We will speak more in relevant the global financial crisis because that was the steepest fall. We want to see how during this crisis, how the government respond. This is a chart pulled out from the SD graphic somewhere in 16th of May. So what you have seen over here, this is the PPI, the property price index. And it is in this manner, this histogram below measure the yearly volume. I mentioned you had the anti-speculation measure, after which this was the part when it comes off in 1997, during the Asia financial crisis, deferred payment was introduced because the whole volume drops almost 32% within a year from 1997 to 1998. Then around this part, the government steps in again in July with 2 million stimulus. November, they find that it's not enough. They added in another 10.5. And there was a cut also in the employer CPF 10%. And at this point where, you know, you have Singapore itself go into recession, you have 2.2B after the dot-com bubble burst in July 2001, followed by 11.3 billion again in October. And they also allow the foreigner to take HDB loan. Proud to that, in 1996, this was one of the measures that they stopped the foreigner from taking the loan. And they also removed the deemed income tax gain. Here you see during the SARS, there was so much of the stimulus, the fiscal policy stimulus that has been pumped into the system. And SARS period, they did add in another 1.23 million. This was the area where it really shot up. Well, all the things that happened before this, particularly when SARS comes in, the market has already gone through a, quite a steep fall. Although there's a rebound over here, it's from 1996 all the way, it's almost like eight years. But this is a period where you see government do a lot of measure. They leave up capital gain tax, they allow foreign assets to SG loan. In 2005, they reduce the stamp duty. This is key. In property itself, you reduce the loan to value. You, sorry, you raise it to 90% and then you reduce the cash payment from 10 to 5% within this period. And this is where the market really picks up. Sentosa, the birth was the first residential launch. Before this, the land sale started in 2003. Then we know the 2007, it was an amazing year, a lot of M block that hits about almost 12 billion. And the market saw between this 2006 all the way up to Q2 of 2008. Deferred payment was also disallowed in October 2007. Now here may I just explain a little bit. The deferred payment is disallowed, but you have seen also current projects which are really TOP, they have obtained the CSC certificate of statutory completion. They are no more under the control of housing. So these are what we call completed project. The developer is at liberty to offer deferred payment. So the building and construction don't have the deferred payment, but the project that are TOP, they allow deferred payment. And of course, global financial crisis set in. At this point, it was something where it also probably was at that point, the first that has been encountered in Singapore. The, every nation, I would think in any crisis, the most fearful is a bank run. So what happened is that Lehman Brothers was the, what we call the institution that was badly affected. Back then in US, the housing was soaring and they packaged this as mortgage security, sold it again in secondary market. So when their housing bubble burst, all these become defaults. So in Singapore, this AIG, also AIA is affected. And there was about, I think MBS says there are 8,000 people that bought about 500 over million Lehman Link structural note. So there was people queuing up. So government has got to step in to give this assurance. They set aside 115 billion to guarantee all bank deposit. And in January 2009, 20.5 B is about 8% of GDP again, stimulus package. And in November, within the same year, they openly declared the recession is over. Market shot all the way up. But at this point, all the liquidity was so amazing because of the QE. And you see all the cooling measures starts from this point. Yeah, before this, another area where I want to mention 209 when it moved up, there was this removal of interest absorption scheme. It was introduced in the beginning, somewhere in March 209. Within just six months, MAS removed it because the liquidity was flush. The system was flush with liquidity because of the QE. So this was an improved economic condition, low interest rate, 
And you see just in Q2 and Q3 of 2009, market hit this sort of volume higher than the previous year. It was only 13,006 that was sold. And of course, all the cooling measure, I don't have to tabulate it. It's a series of cooling measures, starting with stellar stamp duty, after which the uh, APSD, and we go on the, the tri trigger point that caused the market to drop was actually the TDSR, total debt servicing ratio in June 2013. Then somewhere after 15 quarters, just before it, you know, they relieved the stellar stamp duty from four years to change it to three years. And you had the end block, which you recall in 2017, 2018, this is even much higher than the previous round, it's about 18.74 billion. And of course, the last APSD again, this is where uh, it, it was introduced because they felt that market may just pick up. Lawrence Wong, our development minister says, if this is not imposed, you have gone up 15%. And now the current situation is we have COVID-19 and look at the amount of the government stimulus is 19.2% of GDP. So just to recap, what has happened in 1998, 2001, and of course in October, the global financial crisis. You look at the amount as you compare, this is so much greater than the past few rounds. All these events demonstrate the government's ability to find its policy, its willingness to make tough decisions, and the key thing is the responsiveness to market signal. Let's just cover a bit of COVID-19. We have seen how government steps in to help in SARS and also to help in the global financial crisis. Global equity market siphoned off almost 30 trillion. Federal Reserve in US announced they will put up about 2.3 trillion. Globally, this UN Secretary General said that they will do whatever it takes. He estimated that it's going to cost the whole world about 10% of global GDP. Global GDP in 2017 is about 80 trillion. So we are talking about 8 trillion if you have every country that add together. MES announced that the economy will go into a recession. In fact, they lower it subsequently in the next slide I will show you. But at that point, in the, maybe in March, at that area of that, they mentioned that it's going to be minus four to minus one. Currently, if you look over here, the take-up rate has dropped 12%. This was a series to show the GDP growth. Each time when it go down to the negative part, it was prop up. So we have seen in during the manufacturing recession, which didn't cover, we see Asia financial crisis, we see dot com, we see global financial crisis. We are now here. So you all know that there was three package, unity, resilient and solidarity relief package that was introduced. Total is 59.9B, which consists of unity, resilient and solidarity. But look at this part, they have actually set aside 160 billion. This was amazing. This is the first time also we have seen that the government allow that the people with residential property loan can apply to defer their payment in both principal and interest. So there are also a lot of all these packages also supporting jobs. They, this literally is not a monetary policy, it's a fiscal policy where cash are hand out to household as well. So the fear of people defaulting on their loan is not a concern. They even come in with a temporary measure. It's the first time they pass a bill to avoid a lot of dispute on contractual obligation where there are events that have been booked, people who have booked the restaurant for marriage and all this. They even legalize deferment of contractual obligation. They enforce also the property rebates from the landlord to be passed to tenant and they increase rental waiver. So much has been done in this three package. And I guess after this three package, we all know in 26 this month, they announced the fortitude package. So the whole objective of all this, if you look at it, is to ensure business continuity and prevent bankruptcy, to keep employment and have household. But I felt overall is to reaffirm the nation status that has since been globally recognized as a regional safe haven for long-term investment. So we all know the 42 package was introduced in this 26, but I find that there is always a dichotomy between saving life and saving economy. They want to save the economy, but they also want to focus on saving life. And that's the reason why the circuit breaker, they will not leave it up immediately, it's going to be in phase. But while they impose this phase opening, they realize that there's more that they have to help. And this time around, the 42 package is coming in very strongly to help on jobs because the MTI reduced again the economy from minus four to minus seven. And this is 33 million 
and you realize that the focus was on creating job and build skill. This was announced on 26th of May. So they call it a landmark package and 92.9 .9 billion on 19.2. This amount is almost just behind Germany, which is 31.6 and behind Japan, 19.6. And you look at them, their GDP is of course much bigger. Japan is coming in almost like 200 over B. But the point to note is that among the other countries and particularly in the Asia, Southeast Asia region, our government literally is using no debts. The rest of the other country is on credit guarantee. But we are coming, coming in with this injection based on our reserve, which is one trillion. So of course this year they expect that there will be budget deficit, but you can see this is how much the government has recognized the severity of this crisis and so much it's almost at five times, if you recall, remember that the global financial crisis was about 20.5 million, now it's 100 million, close to 100 million. And we are only using about 60%. If the case should turn, maybe a concern of the second wave or the concern of the trade tension that developed between China and US, there is still about almost 60 billion that they can come in again to help the country. So what about the other related fundamentals? I had this chart that is pulled out by a research house. They tabulate the duration of the bull market versus the bear. Bull means the rising market, bear means the falling market. You'll find that generally, you, there are two percentage. You had the total return and you have the annualized return. But you'll find the time frame. Generally, bull market lasts about 6.6 .6 years with this sort of return, whereas a down market lasts only about 1.3 years with an average accumulative loss of 38%. So literally in any crisis moment, it's pretty shortly. And most of the time, the window for buyers who are looking for bargain, you have to be quick. If sort of bargain, then don't miss it. It's also a low interest environment. They are reducing it to almost near zero. The talk is they may want to bring it below the negative mark. I don't see this helping at all because then literally, if it's a negative interest, right now it's more importantly to help with the fiscal measure to sustain job, to keep the economy going. So our interest rate is also very low following the Fed Reserve that lowered the interest rate. And you had the other fundamental that we know, the population now at this point is about 5.8. We had the white paper in 2013 that they're projecting it should hit about 6.9. We wouldn't know, but I see that the population, if you ask my opinion, I think it will continue to rise. So maybe by another five years time, it won't surprise you they were hitting about 6.2 million. I tabulate this price recovery after we have seen all the crises overall and core central region, rest of central region and outside central region. Asia financial crisis, financial crisis this period and also the dot com during this period and global financial crisis and the recent recovery after the TDSR and the market drop 15 quarter. If I tabulate this itself, you will find core central region in percentage yes is 9.6, but we can't say, oh, it's so low. Because the quantum average, maybe any property in core central region, you look at it, 8 million, this is almost close to about 10%, so it's 800,000. Versus a property which is maybe say 2 million, so you can rise up 15%, it's only about 300,000. So in terms of quantum, percentage wise is lower, but the magnitude of gain is much bigger. So this is a tabulation of how so far the market has responded. The last crisis, the amount is all two digit we haven't seen the increase, the recovery of this COVID. Okay, this will be the next segment that I want to translate fundamental into actionable insight. Because we want to know what is the relevancy. Why are you telling us all these past crises, all these stimulus, and exactly where does that lead to in my decision making? So the point I want to bring across is that you can observe buyer, seller, investor mode and participation from the transaction volume done. That means to say, are there action? And if there are action, you want to know what should be the right volume to constitute a positive sign. Because volume reveals the market strength. In a nutshell, it's a very powerful trading technique because you can look deeply to be able to grasp the process and move a price. Simply put, volume allows you to translate fundamental into actionable insight to get ahead of competition. This is a chart by Emmentai. I managed, we are a much entity between Orange Tea and Emmentai and Company. So we have the privilege to also have the articles from the research house of Emmentai. What you have seen over here, 
This is property price index quarterly plot histogram below are in quarterly basis. The former one, ST graphic is on a yearly basis. Three line was being drawn. I will explain later on, you will see how significant this three line is. One at the 7,000 mark transaction volume, the other one at 4,000, and another one at 2,000. You've seen how when we compare, you can't see everything by isolation is on comparison, then you get a greater picture. Volume has been declining. Now, property is different from stock market because you're talking about tangible assets, you can't sell short, okay? So you actually get supply when you're buying, you're buying from the developers who buy land, who construct, who, who build, you know, they give you a good product. So in the way when market comes off, the volume was dipping. Notice that it is below 2,000. But look at this part, market picks up. You'll find that in the stock market, when it's coming down in great volume, it's people selling. But in this case, as I mentioned, we can't sell short in property. So an interest that picks above 4,000 mark is a very good bullish indication that the market is rising. You see the drop from this point? This was the dot-com bubble. Even before you hit that point, volume has declined. Maybe not in just one quarter, it doesn't cause you to react. But if you go on for the next two, three quarter, something may not be right. You know, if you just reflect, if you just want to analyze from the volume. And you see at this point, again, interest coming in. Now between this period, it's almost about two years. I want you to take note, it doesn't mean that you buy only on high volume, but the point is that this could be a case of a buyer market where there is lackluster, lethargic interest, but they are attractive buy as well. But here, before the market actually turns, the volume picks up. And significantly, when it comes above the 4,000, it's a very good indication that the market is gaining momentum. But of course, we know all the other crises, as I just rightly point out, there was impending Iraq war at the SARS, and then the market dipped below. This was one of the lowest volume that's ever recorded, which is below 2000. Then we know the land sales in 2003 and then following which SARS comes in. But again, I mentioned there was a lot of things back then, it was Go Chok Tong. They do a lot of road shows, they go around, they say they will open up, they will build integrated resort and they will uh, you know, give the flexibility that Singapore wants to transform the landscape. So look at these five quarters, that was increasing is almost more than a year. If you see such a volume, market has actually didn't turn, but volume is giving you the signal that the interest is building up. Of course, we can't compare just one drop, you know, because the subsequent quarter, if you want to see this, then you look at the next quarter, the jump is tremendous. And this is very important because you are seeing three quarter that the volume is crossing the 4,000 mark. It's a very healthy sign. It's followed by another two quarters, and needless to say, market soared up. And this was almost a record that you have seen over this entire 20 years history. Then you have the end block. I want to highlight this. Okay, because the green histogram, the portion on the green refers to the new sales. The dark portion refers to the secondary market, the resale. Now resale provide liquidity. So all this end block, eventually these people have to buy a replacement home. But the point is, before the global financial crisis comes in, somewhere around October, you find the new sales has dropped. That's a very significant drop. And this is another low volume that is recorded below 2000 mark. And this was a part where the government comes in with a stimulus package. Then look at this point, we will then discuss about what actually happened that caused a V-shape you know, turnaround. We hope that this is COVID will also be a V-shape, but we need to explain what actually happened over there. But the rise in volume is a very good indicator. And you see the uh, new sales shot up almost more than three times. These two circles that I just highlighted was an amazing time for a lot of people. Many people make a lot of money. But this time around, as it goes up because of low interest, because of liquidity, and this is also the reason why the government steps in with all the cooling measure. And we may not understand why we're pulling measure, the market was still going up. This is a sustained rise, by the way. And we know now because of, if without the cooling measure, this again will be euphoric buying. It could even go much higher. Same thing, the new sales volume picks up. Now look at this part, Clice seems to be tapered off, reflected in the URA index. Volume is declining over four quarter. So you don't have to wait 
until the TBLs happen, something tells you that caution could be somewhere around here. And TDSL came in in June 2013. This is the part 15 quarter that it comes off. Look at it again, 2013 to 2015. In a way, I don't know whether I should use this word, but somehow Singaporean property is in their bloodline. If you stay two years, you don't touch a property, your hand get itchy. So these are the few quarter that actually see that the market was trying to cross 4,000, but it did not because the subsequent quarter shows that it declined. That means the drop in the property market was still ongoing, but it's very minor. And then we have the M block that comes in. See when the M blocks comes in before that three quarters already right crossed the 4,000 mark. And over here, the volume shot up. I want to highlight this itself just before the last ABSC that comes in. 7 million, it hit 7 million. It's also because of the impending US and China trade war that is concerned. And that's the reason why the third ABSC was just the beginning of third quarter. This was second quarter, which end in June, June itself, and the volume hit 7,000. So is the authority watching the volume? I bet they are. And over here, we have seen before the COVID happened, the volume has been coming off as well. So 92.9 stimulus package, how would the market respond compared to the previous 20.5? This is expected second quarter to be one of the lowest. The actual number is not up. So we're going to compare also a new sales and resales. How does it go? You know, in these two particular quarters itself, we see new sales, resales exceed the new sales because the black portion is almost larger than the green portion. And it comes to this area. This is where the new sales is almost two thirds of the resale. High volume of the new sales. This part here, you can see that they are all below the 4,000 mark. So in my opinion, resales provide liquidity. A healthy resales exceeding new sales volume or on par is actually a good sign. We want to highlight these two areas because we think the third, this second quarter, the volume should be about the same. At that point, the index hasn't reached the bottom, but it dropped about 7.5 points. Yep, this was the lowest volume. So right now it's one five, Q1 is 152.1. So the question is, what is going to be Q2? We know April, they estimate, this is the estimate of 309 by Singapore Business Review. And they compare it also to April 2019, which I pulled out was 830 resale sold. So you compute, the total is about 623. May, you may be doing somewhere also around the same, maybe 800,004. So let's see June when they open, they can pick and cross above the 2,000 bar. Volume are tracked by URA and MBS, Monetary Authority of Singapore. They not only give you the index, they tabulate all the quarterly of the completed, uncompleted, subtotal and the resale. You look at this part where I highlight again is 7186. It's interesting when I look at the macro prudential policy of property market that was being in, uh, tabulated by MBS in their journal, they look at demand and supply variable, interest rate, they look at lending measure, the policy variable, they look at GDP, they look at a lot of other stuff, they look at even the land supply. And why was price not raised above the volume? Instead, they put the right on top is actually property transaction. So property transaction, volume itself precede price and it's very key variable, it's very key component to watch. So what have we established? We have established that the government is responsive to market signal, market recover from all crises, and volume encompasses all underlying fundamentals as well as market participant interest. Now you can have all the fundamentals that we all know. It, it's bit and pieces. Okay, they are very thorough. The analysts, the economists does a very great job, same like our, all the research house. They give you all the indication, the completed, they give you the various uh, you know, quarterly figures and all that. But usually it's after the, when the quarter is end. So in a way, fundamental can be a bit late. Before I go on to the next segment, we all know we buy a property, not just simply because we like the location, we like the layout, or we have a faith in the developer. We need to know the other landscape. We need to know the potential of the area. And this is where the growth of Singapore real estate industry is very key because the government not only just show you what is going to happen in the next five years, they keep the old master plans for you to compare. 
So of course now we can compare against 2014 because you want to go into an area where you know there's growth potential, you want to know what are the infrastructure added. So this is also another area because when you buy into a country, particularly for foreigners, they want to see in the next five, 10 years, what will Singapore be like? And we are fortunate that our government will deliver what they say they will deliver. Back then, Marina Bay, during the time when they mentioned about it, you realize there was a lot of crisis, but at the end, it's still delivered. It's delayed, but it will be accomplished. So mega project, we want to look at what mega project, how it will influence the property, because when you buy, you want to consider holistically, not just the four wall that you are buying. You want to look at the location and all the other stuff. And this is another area I want to highlight where people say that the economy is a driver of property, but I would think the property is a key driver of economy. We will see why. To me, it's always looking at context. So this will undergird the view that you want to take in five, 10 years for the property market. So master plan, as I mentioned, I had gone through quite a few of the areas that I've seen a lot of changes, even right up to even Bedok. But this is another area where my colleague in two weeks ago, Elvin has highlighted particularly on this area. This is one of the hotspots. You see in May 2, sorry, in 2014 URA master plan, this is all the reserve site in yellow. These are the, uh, what we call the community site. And sometimes they put the H and W, you'll know that it's a hospital. These are mixed development. These are uh, commercial on the first story, then residential on top. And light blue is mixed commercial. So you'll find that in 2019, all this has been changed. The demography, the population increased. So many of the reserve sites have been converted to residential site. And particularly this, this spot where the uh, legend that you highlight that it's going to be a hospital and a hotel is now turned to mixed development. It's going to be upcoming transportation hub with 865 condo unit. It's, going to, it's announced actually in December last year that they're going to include community, hawker center, indoor sport hall, library and elderly facility. So this is another area that is going to be a mixed development. This was the former, I, I remember correctly, it's May 2017, it was go and go building being en bloc. So this is going to be a link at Beauty World. And mind you, this is freehold mixed development. And then you have another upcoming one, which was a former en bloc, Good Luck Garden, also over here. But the existing two other projects that is now running, which Orange Tree is marketing, is Jane Tree and Buick Kismis. A lot of interest after they have realized that this area shows a huge potential. You'll see that beside master plan where it shows you what can be built, the plot ratio and all that, the uh, urban planners are now looking at beyond just the master plan. They want to kind of change the landscape. They want to enhance the environment. So you realize that Beauty World was also identified as under the urban design area. Most of it are in the central core region, the downtown core, in the CBD area, Orchard. There's only pockets of which are classified as urban design. Of course, Holland Village is one of them. So when you see that the area has this, Newton is also one of them under urban design. So they will rejuvenate the city. They tell you this is all the connectivity they will do. They encourage the old buildings to be transformed. So this is what is going to happen like Celsius, Robinson and Anson area. You can see even from right here, you can cross right across to Chinatown. It wants to give you the network of the street and quarter, the square connectivity. So the whole landscape is going to be transformed. Because if you see the city area, all the old building as it is, you know, they will encourage the owners to change, they, to turn it to a mixed development. Like the recent Alibaba, which was an anchor tenant in AXA Tower, they bought over a big chunk of it. And it's likely they have submitted the plans to change it to hotel and residential as well. So mega project, Cross Island Line, as you know, phase one has been announced, is proceeding. This will increase the whole network from 230 to 360. This is a huge increase. And it's crossing from you know, the east to west. And then, of course, Greater Southern Waterfront, 30 kilometers of promenade right from Paspanjang all the way to Garden by the Bay. Sentosa is involved. So there is a possible revival of all the Sentosa property where the price is now very attractive. Then you see Changi Airport. Now all the while, we know that Singapore has won many records of the best airport. The best is not just good enough. It's, it doesn't bring in the revenue. They, they want to be like Dubai to make it that Singapore can become a very good transit point. So this uh, Zhuwe Changi was being built. And for a small country like us, we have five terminals. Can you imagine that? 
this is a segment I want to spend a little bit of time to tell you why property is the main driver of the economy. You see, from the point when the government ends sales, the developer tender, they may take up a bank loan, banks is involved, there are a lot of uh, jobs created, those structural engineers, surveyor, architect, engineers, and during the piling, you know, the generator and all the equipment, the tower crane, and then when the building is up, you know, the concrete, the iron steel bar, and then the M&E work, and most importantly, you will see that when people get a key and they start to renovate everything right from the living area, the furnitures and ceilings and the aircon, the lights, right to dining area, and you go down to kitchen, all the utensil, the fridge, the microwave oven, right to even the bedroom, your, yeah, your curtains and all the stuff, and even in the toilet, yeah, a lot of sanitary wear. So the point I'm trying to say, a lot of things, the money was spent. A lot of food is on the table. So it comes from when a property, when you see a property is being tendered. So if you ever go to a country, you drive from the airport down to your hotel and about one an hour drive, you don't see any tower crane, something is not right to the country. So this is an article where it says China has lived up and they even say that it influenced 40 other business sector. It's so crucial. Capital Land, they've really opened up and their sales was about 5.5 times for January and February. That was in March. So, you know, the authority, Monetary Authority of Singapore has centered on property market because they, given the importance of this market, because it affects the balance sheet of a household, bank loan portfolio, and the potential systemic risk. Okay, so we have the backdrop now. We have seen how fundamental you can use volume to gauge, to guide you. We have seen that you're buying a property, you need to know whether the country, future potential, you need to know what is in the pipeline, what are the mega project. And that will sort of aid you to have a view to see how when we navigate in the future, this macro will help you, will sustain your position, thinking that, hey, you know, short-term rise, short-term drops itself, is it going to be very severe? We will have that kind of confidence that the market eventually will recover. So this article, the way they put it is that they say it's a given, the sharp fall. This was somewhere in April. The question is by how much? So when I go through from this second aspect of it, technical analysis, we are not trying to predict price. We just want to give a feel of the property market because I find it doesn't do us any harm or cause us anything to anticipate what my lies ahead. So just a comparison, fundamental and technical. To recap, we study all the factors that have the impact on the market, whereas technical analysis use past chart pattern and trend to forecast price of the market. As I mentioned, fundamental analysis is important, but in a way, the shortcoming is it could be a bit slow, a bit late, because you don't have all the data at hand. So to put it down in a nutshell, I would think fundamentally focus on the cost, which are really the reason, whereas technicians focus on the effect. You'll find technical analysis, the SMU is teaching it, there's a syllabus for those who want to aspire to be a floor trader in Cymax or in Booking House. As a dealer, this will be part of the financial training. We see private banker, Credit Suisse, talking about it. You Google, you, they give you a whole list. There are people who are on the financial instrument are all equipped with understanding technical analysis. We see hedge fund, hedge fund manager talking about it. You see, Eloy Wave analysis, which is one, one of the technical tools that we will be considering, we will be evaluating later on. They believe that price moves first and fundamental comes second. This is something I love it personally. This guy, Martin Schwartz, he was the champion trader in Wall Street. He has won nine out of 10 trading and total average return is 210. He made almost as much money as the other contestant. Look at what he say. I always laugh at people who say, I've never met a rich technician. I love that. It's such an arrogant, nonsensical response. I used fundamental for nine years and I got rich as a technician. Okay, we are now going to the URA property price index. This is what? Normally, most people will do, they draw a trend line, they may draw a channel, they may draw a middle channel, which is fine, okay? But Eloy Wave is one of the tools that was developed by this uh, Ralph Nelson Eloy. is way back all the way to 1930, he's an accountant. He studied, uh, I heard from the report, it's thousand over charts to come up with this concept. So basically, he felt that this is reflecting, it's a law of nature because many things in the universe move by a way. There is a collective psychology and sentiment of the market that drives the supply and demand. 
So what it says is that market will move in five wave and three wave. Correction wave normally is in three. So these are called impulse wave going up. This is an impulse wave, this is a correction wave. And it can break down into five minor wave and following which three correction wave and continue with all this. So here to here can be just first wave and second wave. So there is grand cycle, super grand cycle. So it doesn't mean that you see a five wave up, three wave down, market is over. It's only just one cycle. The cycle can continue. We are now currently over here, the URA property price index. Interestingly, um, you'll find when we want to go into this, I need to highlight the area where we need to focus because corrective wave is more difficult to identify. There are three kinds of corrective wave. We can call it a zigzag, like a lightning strike. Usually when market has gone up, it pulled down, there's a pullback and it comes off it's in three and it can break down into five, three, five. This is flat. Instead of stopping at midpoint, it can go back to the same point or went above it and come down. And same thing, it can break down in this manner. And it can be in a triangle form, which will cause a lot of confusion, but we know this is a correction. But there are a couple of rules that we need to abide if you want to follow this principle. First off is that if you see the first wave, the second wave cannot go beyond it. The third wave cannot be the shortest. Because if you count it this way, you'll find that this point to this point is in fact a corrective wave. So if you label this as the third wave, it's the wrong count. And the other principle is that the fourth wave pullback can never overlap the first wave. Again, if it overlaps from here, all the way to here is a running correction. So this is not an impulse wave. You have seen one in Dow Jones currently, you look at this point as it come off, it come off in three parts, one, two, three, it go up also in three parts, and now we are here. So you can see a very clear wave formation, a corrective wave formation form in the market. Now we don't bend the theory to fit the market. The market has to unfold itself. And you look at the property price index, which was from 1975 all the way until here, 45 years. You have seen one, two, three, and four. Okay, this is a corrective way to me, it's a triangle. And you look at it, it come down first leg, and you go up second leg, come down third leg. This second leg also is break down into three parts. So you ask me why the fourth wave cannot be here. Market can end here and this is first, second, third, fourth, fifth. But you notice one of the principles, the fourth wave can never go beyond the first wave. So four cannot be here. How about here? One, two, three, four, then we finish with five. Now, if it is from here, this correction looks a bit real, it's incompleted because if it is finishing far of it, it should pull down even lower. Unless it go further up and pull down this way. But when I compare the possibility, I find this was a more realistic fourth way because you look at this part as it goes up, even with cooling measure, it punched through the global financial crisis and the Asia financial crisis. So this is a very sustainable rise. So let's evaluate how it will go from here since the market has shown that it's following the theory. It must first show that it follow the wave instead of I trying to force the theory into the market. So it's unfolding the fifth wave from this point where we see A, B, fifth wave can break down into A, B, C, D, E. And we are probably here. Okay, we have seen the first wave of the fifth. Now it's doing the second leg, coming down B. And this B itself, can break down into three legs, which is A, B, C. So we are seeing A, B, and this just finished off at 152.1. It is coming off quite lightly, and we are seeing the third leg of the B wave. The whole thing is the wool market view will be challenged if it comes below this point. Because if you really look at it, this was even the last run could not cross it, but even with cooling measure, the market punched through and we are talking about a correction of 13 years. And to say that the fifth wave end over here, because some would think that this is first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Okay, we are done. So market is coming down. Now, if that's the uh, kind of connotation that you want to take, even five up, three down, this whole thing can be just a cycle. We know that long-term plan, every five years, government will always come up with a lot of a master plan, they will tell you with concept plan, they will want to transform the landscape. But in any case, to say that about four years and we are done because you know it's coming down, I would be 
I can only say that this is possible, but if you know that the background, there is a lot of all these infrastructure projects, there's a lot of changes to the master plan, there's so much new thing that's coming on board, I would think the continuation of the market of feet going up is still there. So we are not saying that we have a crystal ball. The point I'm trying to say is that this whole analysis is basically an exercise of examining various scenarios to add value in an environment of limited visibility. Now, I just heard a webinar that one of the speakers say, the analysts are now you know, flying blind, which is true, I'm also flying blind. But if you do not have something to show you, to guide you, technical analysis is so common to a lot of broking house, to a lot of traders. But in property market, because it's not a day-to-day -day kind of thing, it's a quarterly update of the analysis of the uh, index itself. And very seldom you see people talking about technical analysis. Good thing is, is on a quarterly basis, we do not have to monitor it day by day. We can watch the volume to guide us, but we can use this to confirm. We can also look at the overall picture, big picture, what is the macro doing? So this is just an exercise. It's not telling you that, hey, uh, we seem to have a crystal ball. We know how the market will unfold. Nobody knows. Yeah. Because if you remember the key point I mentioned, you must analyze it with an unbiased mind, knowing that the market will know exactly they will be always right. If your analysis is otherwise, it's your analysis that is wrong. It's never the market. So we also show, wants to reflect this in the HGB. You look at HGB, there was a falling triangle, a diagonal shape. And the part here was interesting is global financial crisis has got no impact on the HGB. This was the stock market. Now, of course, you heard about Weiji crisis, and this is one of the books I have also think that it is perfectly correct. Trouble is opportunity. In the third chapter, it's a highlight, a chapter titled Rule 3, Trouble is Opportunity. Then you had this talk where a lot of them now, analysts, and many of them give their view, whether it's going to be a V-shape recovery, U-shape, W-shape, where it goes up and then it comes back again because of second wave. And of course, this is the worst case that it will just drag, 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 and it takes you about two to three years down the road or even longer. We have seen the uh, MTI uh, have really lowered their forecast. And this is by DBS Bank for this fourth quarter. They are depicting a U shape. Okay? The previous trajectory now is revised. So they are expecting the forecast to be minus 5.7. You look at UOB, they give you three variables. They say V shape, likely 20% best. And this is the base case, they expect about 55% and the worst case, 25%. So they are also advocating a U shape. But for me, I look at the past, this was superimposed with the PPI together with the SDI and also the down zone, the light blue is a down zone. Now during the Asia financial crisis, it's got nothing to do with them, they are rising. But this was brought down by them, by the US side and the market property index came down only about 25% whereas stock market is more volatile, almost 50%. So what do we want to say over here now? We see that this was the point where the market pulled up in the V-shape. So are we able to see a V-shape now? Uh, just on the examining closely, uh, this is a STI on a monthly basis because I can't plot the daily charts to superimpose with a quarterly chart. So the closest is to draw. Look at this little table over here. This is a daily chart that you can see market has come off before this deep plunge, in fact, stock market is coming down. Now, we find that the PPI, the property index, lacks the SDI. Right at about fourth quarter of 2007, stock index has already come off. I can't, the low was actually in the 9th of October, but we are using the month end. So it's 3706, but the low, the high is actually 3865. This was the high. So same thing, the uh, PPI, the legs, the SDI. SDI actually bottomed out first, somewhere in first quarter, which was 9th of March. This was the lowest, but on the month end, it was 1.6. But the point I'm trying to say is that stock market could be an indicator sometimes for us to help us weather exactly how the property market will pan up. So what occurred at, this, at that time? If you recall, at that point, there was this Alexis and Caspian, they were introduced. And at that point, it was also the interest absorption scheme Alexis was a project where I think it's 200 over units with 21 shops. It's all fully sold by the first weekend. Caspian by Fraser, when they introduced, it was three minutes walk to the lakeside MRT. The area there are doing average, the other condo between 600 to 750. They are offering from low six to 650. Their initial buy was also very attractive at about 585 PSF. And 
what I meant is that for you to know whether it's going to be a V-shape, it comes in where there is sentiment. There is something exciting. So we do not know whether the excitement will come from, it can be any project, it can be even copper where they launch it, it was just almost the point where the circuit breaker or rather the COVID-19 is really happening and before, just before the circuit breaker was announced. And if they relaunch, it can be again to catch on the excitement. It can also be, you know, the existing project that is in the beauty world, in tree view at Kismis, that people see the upcoming tender that's going to be exciting if the launch or if rather the tender were to attract a good bid, the rest of the other condo that is going to be there is going to benefit. So this sort of thing create the sentiment because you can't have, we are of course blessed, we are encouraged, we see those articles, certain people buy uh, what we call a GCB or a foreigner bought, you know, a penthouse. Yes, but the people on the floor, on the ground, on the street will say, that's not me, these are the rich people. So you need an event, you need an excitement, a project that can trigger that there is a lot of what we call a lot of talk, a lot of hype up before the actual launch is on social media, people talk about it. We do not know which project. Okay, if you say that you're going to wait until the beauty world, that particular project, which is the integrated track, uh, the hub itself, then it can be probably by the first quarter of next year. But the point is that to know whether it's going to be a V-shape, it comes in from sentiment and it comes in from a certain event, certain project that can move the people to say this is the time to go in. So there's seven reasons to, op to remain optimistic. Of course, property is a roof over our head. Our industry, in a way, was classified as non-essential service, but real estate is an essential need. Okay, no matter how it's an essential need. We have already mentioned how it affects the GDP. So I find property is something that everyone will want to love to own. Singapore remains a safe haven, and we are also the reputation is you are champion of good governance, and there's these five T words, and combined with the destination that this is going to be one of the what we call world most innovative tech center where we can uh, provide a unique environment for uh, you know keep companies to provide a unique uh, uh, what we call values that, that, that will have these five keywords inside transparency truthfulness trustworthy and then it, with all these value chains around a set of progressive value that is empowered by the right tenant and right technology so singapore remain a safe haven you will find that a lot of people are still coming over this site and we have seen also the response from this pandemic is a landmark. Of course, you saw the amount that has been fished out as a fiscal measure. King Sui Kit is uh, our deputy PM is an amazing man. You know, he was uh, back then a chairman during the 2005 to 2011, the chairman of MES, before he stepped into politics in 2011. Before he stepped into politics at 2011, he won the Central Bank Governor of the Year Award. That was announced in February. And I can recall, so I read an article by our late LKY, he says this is one of the men of the most fine mind that I know. So you look at the way the package that has been released during this COVID is amazing. It covers almost every spectrum of the economy, right down to the men on the street, to the household. It's very detailed, very thorough, and emphasizing not only just on settling the current event, he looks ahead. There is a task force that plans for how the economy should recover. That's where all this package of unity, resilience, solidarity, and fortitude that comes about. So our government response is amazing. And this will, of course, give a lot of confidence to the foreigner. Again, I want to say the demand in sales will only be deferred, not destroyed. This is definitely the case because confident, con consumer confidence in the long term matter most, especially in the crisis moment. And your confidence can come only if you see that the nation is in safe hand. And we all know customer looking to for housing need either pay to a lender or to a landlord. Yes, if they choose to opt not to consider, they will want to wait, then they will probably go into rental. But if you look at it, the crisis is always a case where they take out a group of buyer, those who adopt a wait and see attitude, and those maybe a financial constraint could not get seen. But those other people where they are really looking for housing need is either they buy or they, they rent. So it's either you pay the lender or the landlord. And there are always transactions at any crisis, same in April, same in May. There are people that just have to sell. Those who have bought a um, condo, they could, have, uh, been, they could have been in the market in the fourth quarter of last year. They're given six months to sell. And fortunately, the government extended that. They also extend this, what we call, to the developer. 
they are now have, a, have another six months for them before they could uh, sort of be imposed with the penalty. So there are always transactions at any crisis moment. And we also know it involves equity and debt. Unless somebody buy with full cash, if not, you find that bank loan is affected. So if the property comes down, it will pull down also the credibility. I mean, the risk, the fear of, you know, the banks are affected. And we know it affects GDP. So these are the seven reasons that I would still remain optimistic. So in summary, it is basically to show that the market will return to normalcy. We saw that the GDP is down, but it will come back because real estate is a significant sector of the country GDP growth. We can count on government to sweep in to mitigate things in this regard. And we have just shown you that it encompasses all the factors that drive the progression and direction. So to say flying blind, uh, yes and no. Yeah, you can watch how the market unfold because the way how the mass behavior is, is more unpredictable than the market. But sentiment on the ground has to be triggered by something that is exciting, that someone is watching. It can be even the, the M that they relaunch again. If at a attractive price, people will go in. But the whole thing is that property market remains to be something that I felt it will be a rising trend. And this is on a long-term perspective that we know there are crises, there are unforeseen events, but it's undergirded by the long-term growth. Foreigners look at the way government is so transparent. Everything that they're going to develop, it tells you ahead of time. And come that time, it materialized. And they see also that everything infrastructure, they want to do the connectivity. And they have also got so much confidence right now that the kind of package, the fiscal stimulus is so amazingly great. So I just want to touch a bit about it. our profile, myself and my wife, Brenda Z. We are both uh, also doing our personal sales, but apart from personal sales, we are doing team management. We are also doing some, handling some ICE uh, projects that is Corals, Novell 18, Boulevard 88, Cascadian Reserve, Southeast Resident, and St. Regis. Quite a few of them are actually ETC-led projects because this is a merged entity between Orange Tai, Orange Tea and Evan Tai and Company. So, so a little bit of ourselves. And I just want to introduce our next speaker, which is Perry Xiao. He's going to talk about Paliba Master Plan transformation. And we have just highlighted master plan is so crucial. You know, you know, just in one, not in just one area, there can be a lot of other areas. So he will be talking about how you identify the right blue chip and how you can benefit and how this principle of the GRC, you know. Perry has been in the market for a long while, as long as I remember. And he has also been uh, holding talks in projects and is a motivator, motivational speaker. So tune in to next Sunday, 7 June. It's also the same time, and this is all because Orange Tea is bringing this to you. Thank you for your attention. If there will be a Q&A session, I'll pass the time back to Ramesh. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Elton. Um, I must say I'm quite impressed uh, with the amount of information you managed to cover in your speech. Uh, covering past data trends, URA master plan fundamentals, hotspots, and your technical analysis of your future trends. I must say I was particularly quite impressed with your analysis of the Elliott's Wave Theory in relation to the, the property market. Thank you. I'm sure our listeners are also quite intrigued and I'm sure they have a lot of questions. A quick gentle reminder for our listeners tuning in. If you have any questions pertaining to the talk or the property market in general, at any point during the session, I mean, at any point now, you can uh, just click on the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen and type in your questions. Either I will... Uh, address the question directly to Elliot here, uh, at, at uh, sorry, at Alton here, <laughs> or our panelists will help answer the question. Um, Alton, I have a question for you uh, before okay. I go on to take the panelist question. In your speech, you mentioned market sentiments. Uh, so that, that's quite interesting when you uh, put it against market analysis or forecasts. It's, it's a bit of a yin and yang. Uh, how do you see the interplay between market sentiments and uh, market analysis and forecasts? How, how do these two, two factors relate to each other? Good question. In a way, sentiment is a crowd psychology. In layman terms, you can say it gives you a few of the market, the tone of the market. Of course, this is important because sentiment will kickstart um, the movement of the price, like what I mentioned, it comes from probably a high up where people are looking forward to certain launch and the information that is available, the publicity that they receive through EDM or through social media seems to indicate that the uh, launch itself is going to be something that you should not miss. 
particularly they, it will tends to be at least about a few percentage lower in terms of price so that people get excited. So in a way, when that kind of uh, happen, you'll find that people who, when this thing materialize, it means people comes in, the paper report it, and wow, the rest of the people who are adopting the way and see will come in. They will drive these people in. So in a way, fundamental may not be ready, but because there are events, there are certain launch, impending launch, that is going to be exciting. So it may not be synonymous to fundamental that the economy has not shown a sign of coming up, but it is ahead of it. It can also be a case where it's by technical analysis that the investor have been watching and they know a certain price point, it's a good price point to come in. So this is how sentiment uh, do play a part. So if you are watching, uh, let's say it's the volume and you're watching the wave, the way how it unfold, the point to note is that the, when that occurs, you will see a spike up in the volume. And that's also where we have mentioned that these are able to tell you, this is what we call actionable insight. It's uh, backed by sentiment. Sentiment is very crucial. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. I think this is the first time I'm hearing this. Uh, so it's, it's really quite interesting because people usually say stick to the fundamentals, but you're saying actually it comes hand in hand. The, the market sentiments, the fundamental analysis, as well as the technical analysis, all sort of interplays with each other. So you cannot ignore any one of this. It's all correlated. So that I think you should do a thesis on this. It's, it's really quite interesting how you, <laughs> you interplay all these factors together. Yeah, it's uh, well put there. Yes, you have to look at everything together. <laughs> Yes, um, I'm going to go into one of the questions from uh, one of our listeners, Mrs. Tan. Uh, her question is, I think it's also something that our, a lot of people are asking in the panelists, just not Mrs. Tan. It's the, since property price index lacks stock market index, as you put it, uh, if so, and so if stock market start to drop, does it mean I must sell my property? how to study the correlation on the stock market and property. So they, yeah, so your analysis, I think this was one of the most exciting part of your presentation. So I think maybe dig a bit, a bit further. So how do you really see the correlation between, sh should I really be studying the stock market analysis and make my decision from that? Or how, how, how should I do it? Well, good question. Anyway, you know, we are not talking about a day-to-day -day kind of trading because like what I mentioned, stock market and right. property market is different. It right. is updated quarterly, but in a way, Yes, you kind of uh, notice that if the stock market were to come down, you know, if you just bought, you simply can't sell as well because there's a seller some duty. Yeah, but we want to, the question is how do you correlate? Okay, the point I'm saying that is, that for instance, you are a seller, and uh, you know probably a resale property that you own and you want to sell because you decided to move on or you want to test the personal reason why you're selling. More importantly, is why you're selling. So when you see that the offer coming in is usually 5% or even more, 8% below what you're asking. You know, when you put up uh, 2 million, people are giving you about 1.8, 200,000 down. So at times like that, to be able to assist in the decision making, you may have to sort of probably consider how the stock market has been doing, maybe over the past few weeks or even a longer period to decide. You know, if it is still a rising trend or it probably had trend downward, it's more or less stabilized. And we've seen a lot of good news that is being unleashed. Then you may, if some time is still on your side, then you can hold back. But of course, if it's in a bearish trend and the trend just started in a couple of weeks, you see the impending, like for instance, the US and China tension and stock market comes off and you find that yes, uh, even at that 5% down, I'm still okay in a sense, I still make profit, you know, so you can still sell. So this is where how you kind of use the stock market to help you in the decision making. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Alison. Um, Mrs. Tan, I hope that answers your question. Um, Okay, there's another question from an anonymous listener. Uh, okay, um, Elson, I, I also remember this point earlier in one of your slides, you mentioned um, volume reveals the strength of the market. Mm -hmm. So this question is from an anonymous listener. He's asking, so does it mean only at high volume, then it's a good time to buy? So should I look at the monthly sales then if, if the volume is higher, should I buy then? Um, uh, direct answer is not necessary, but anyway, it's a good question raised because if you remember what I've said earlier during the crisis, there are always transactions and in fact, you can have another group of buyer, we call that the contrarian, that means they don't follow the herd instinct, but these buyers are more frequently seen in those financial instruments or in stock market. But if you recall in the SARS, during the SARS movement 2003, the volume was literally 
you know, very low is below the 2000 and market didn't really rise much because they are attractive by. So the people have gone in and I know of people who are happy who have gone in because the low volume itself represent a buyer market. It may be lethargic, it may be slow, but you find that it's uh, uh, attractive. So in a way, you can find that, you know, this is not necessarily indicating, I hope that it's not interpreted wrongly, that only a high volume then you can go in. Because volume, if you want to use it in a more pragmatic way, you know when you buy, anyhow, it's going to wait three years before you can sell, right? Of the seller's stamp duty. So even the volume is low, a certain uh, property comes about because of certain location or certain facing or for certain reason where you need to get it, otherwise you'll miss it because you're not buying, you're buying a home, you're buying to stay. So for that matter, if says you, a family wants to move down closer to those popular schools and they've been looking for a right property and none of it come by, but now you had one property, you're not going to deter because the volume is low, yeah? Because you can miss it. So the point I'm saying is that those who are hesitant to, another factor, those who are hesitant to enter the market when volume picks up, then you may have to consider whether you are you still going to be sitting on the fence because then you probably have to buy at a higher price. So all in all, you find that when it will be also able to help seller because you can, some seller who are willing to put the property on the market and you see the volume picks up, well, you may be, if you really want to cash out, then you can time yourself. It can't be immediate, but maybe three to six months down the road, you can expect to fetch a better buy. I think the volume help us in this aspect. Thank you. Thank you, Alton. I hope that answers that question. Um, actually, this is also quite a similar question, but uh, they've added on uh, to the issue of high volume. So the question is, this is from Mike. Uh, what will be your advice? So should we buy now, wait for high volume, or wait for the sentiment to be good? So I think it's, it addresses some of the points you've raised earlier, but how do you compare these three factors? Buy now, wait for high volume, or wait for sentiments to be good? I think that's what all the buyers are secretly waiting for. Uh, still a lot of bias waiting for all these things to pick up <laughs> before they can go in and buy. But what do you have to say to our listeners? Thanks for the question. Anyway, it's also a good question. But what I just mentioned, the short answer is that I don't really know. Because if you ask the analysts, a lot of them are now trying to see whether it's going to be a V-shape and U-shape. Yeah. But I mentioned before, it's going to see how the situation pan out. But we know Singapore, if you look at the macro level, the financial system, you know, the good governance, the interest environment are attractive, the good governance and responsiveness assuring. In all these aspects, if you still have the kind of key concern, but you don't know what will happen next. Now, if that's the case, then it's better that you consider those TOP projects. I mentioned before, deferred payment is still available on those TOTP projects. A project like the CRAS, project like Corals Reflection, projects like Novel 18, South Beach Residence, because you buy a deferred payment, you know it's going to be one, two years. Yeah. Now, if it's a V-shape, you are in. If it's a U-shape, we know it's a repetitive thing. You know, you look at the uh, chart where I just shown all the volume on the historical, the histogram chart, where the, the low, what we call dry spell period is about almost two years, sometimes one and a half, sometimes two and a half years. And that is a period where I deem it as a buyer market. So if you buy and yeah, it's a good deal. But then, you know, when the market picks up, you won't lose out. So this is where I find that uh, people can still come in because there are projects that will offer incentive. You know, for instance, like furniture rebate, you can have, uh, probably there are projects that like, you know, copper, I don't know, of course, uh, BUC, if the price is attractive enough, they may still be able to create excitement. You can have projects like Sloan, Freehold, like uh, Nobel 18, a good location. Yeah, all these are certainly, uh, you know, something that we can consider. So in a way, to summarize that, yes, high volume, good sentiment, they are healthy sign. But if there's an attractive buy, if they are you know, buying where people shun, uh, and then you take the contrarian approach because the location is something that you want, the facing is something you want, or those deferred payment scheme, these are all good moves. I find these are something that you, know, you need to see the scenario and then evaluate accordingly. I trust, I mean, I see this is a, a case where we, we know that going forward, yeah, you will be brought down by too much of uncertainty. But if you were to follow the right kind of data, you will be able to see and sniff up a good opportunity. I hope this clarified. Over yeah, to you. I think to, to, to summarize 
your to summarize what you say, I guess there's always some anomaly somewhere, mm. although you're reading all these trends. So mm. to always there's not no hard and fast rule, but to yeah. be keep in breast of, of all the anomalies. Yeah. I think our listeners today, you can, you should um, contact our Orange Tea salespeople, whoever's yeah. invited you, because uh, at any one point of time, uh, like Elton just mentioned, there could be an anomaly or a very good offer that just pops up somewhere, which may be a deviant from the, the overall market trends, but uh, something that could still be a good buy. Um, I think we are coming close to the end of the session uh, due to time constraints. I'm just going to take one last question. Um, Okay, this is a question from Alfred. Um, can you elaborate more on the wave theory? And if you're, and are you saying it's how the market will unfold? It's a more cheap question. I was trying to pay close attention also, but I think <laughs> it would help that if you can elaborate more on this theory and your, and your correlation with the property market. Thanks for the question. I would love to. You see, I mentioned before, a lot of wave theory is only used if you see the market progression has confirmed itself to the pattern. That means to say, you can't force that theory, the concept into the market. Right. But in the case of our URA price index, like I just mentioned from 1975 until now, 45 years, and you have seen the first wave, second wave, third wave, fourth wave confirm to the pattern. Now, if the market has confirmed to the pattern, the underlying pattern is there, then you can take it from there. If I have seen the fourth wave have ended so beautifully according to the principle, and this principle has been laid down by this author back in 1930, so it's a long time, right? And a lot of uh, what we call traders, uh, institution, and uh, dealers, they are using it. Of course, they, when they discuss with the customer, customers are comfortable if they have always been given good recommendation, they don't need to elaborate into that because customers will just want to know, you tell me what to buy, what to sell, you know, and what, what to pick up. So, but the point is that they can't be, and then you know now the IT, you know, is so amazing. All these people on the floor when they trade stuff, it, it's probably going to be all computerized event that are marked to market. As the price moves, the tools that they are using, there's a lot of other tools. I don't know if it's only one of them. So the point I'm trying to say is that if you recall uh, in the overview, I mentioned technical analysis, no single technical analysis is infallible. That means there's no guarantee to a big bank account. So you have to adopt a very unbiased mind. You can use any tools. It can be those relative strength index, momentum, moving average, whichever. But you need to have an unbiased mind knowing that at all times, and I repeat, it's at all times, market is never wrong. So if your analysis depict otherwise, it's simply the analysis is wrong. It's never the market. So back again to the wave theory, because I find and it's very amazing because I think mass behavior is even more difficult to predict than the market. And if you remember, I just meant, I mentioned that it conformed to uh, what we call a law of nature because universe move in a rhythmical way. So the patterns repeat itself and this is where it makes it more dynamic. I find a lot way more real because it changes according to the market behavior. So it gives you a very good frame, framework of probability. But having said that, please do not just rely on it completely. You have to use it with the other factors, data that comes in. Those research house reports sometimes helps a lot because they give you another perspective. So there are many books and info available online. You can read more about it. You know, what I just cover is really a very basic. So I hope that this extra clarification help. Thank you, Alton. I, I found it quite interesting, your wave theory. You, you, I think the, one of the key takeaways is the fourth cycle before it goes up again is always preceding the, the previous uh, bottom. So that's, I think, one takeaway for all of us. I think the Elliott's theory, I've, I've read about it a bit, it's actually been proven in many financial cycles before. So it's interesting yeah. how you juxtapose that to our property market. And I think it's, it's been very refreshing, something new, something to really look at and uh, analyze our, our property movements as well. Um, I'm just gonna quickly uh, Give another gentle reminder for all our listeners, if you'd like to obtain a copy of Alson's presentation report, feel free to approach your representing Orange Tea and Thai agent for a copy. Uh, be also sure to tune in to another Orange Tea and Thai consumer empowerment webinar next Sunday, same time at 3 p.m. Um, I think I'm going to wrap it up. It brings us to the end of today's session. And I hope all of you found it as useful as I did. I want to express another big thank you to our speaker today, Alson Chia. Thank you so much for all your sharing and uh, your hard work and analysis. 
uh, of all the data. I really appreciate that. And also thanks to our expert panelists who are working hard behind the scenes, answering all the other questions our uh, listeners are listening to. Um, yep, and uh, that's all I have for today. Uh, we will still keep the session open for another 15 minutes if you, if to, un to make sure we answer all the questions coming in. Uh, so please carry on asking questions if you have. Uh, that's all I have for today. So thank you, everyone. Have a beautiful Sunday evening. Till next Sunday, this is Ramesh signing out.